So in my time using this, this laptop, I think it's good, but there's some things you should definitely be aware of this one, and I'll cover that at the end of this video. But first, let's have a little quick look at our design here. So it only weighs 1.25 kilos, which is a very good weight. We've got a 13.3 inch screen in this one, which is IPS. Adobe color gamut coverage is about 74%. And I'll show you a little bit more on that as well, as well as NTSC and sRGB values too for this particular screen. And it covered in glass means it's very reflective. It picks up a lot of reflections. And it would have been nicer if it was a matte screen here, but then we wouldn't, of course, get that kind of color gamut we've got with this one. So it's only about 15 millimeters, the thickness, which is very good. And there's user upgradable storage on the underside of it. So it comes pre-installed with Windows 10 Home, and we do get a SATA 3 drive in this one. So it's not NVMe, not that we would need it with a Core M3. 8100 wide that this has. Eight gigabytes of RAM, which has low power DDR3 spec. It's uh, running at 1600 megahertz and it's only single channel configuration, unfortunately with this, which I think is a bit of an error. It should have been dual channel and that way we get a little bit more in terms of performance. And you'll see later on the performance, this thing is definitely no monster. It's really just designed for light computing, tasks like that. And I wouldn't be editing videos or gaming or anything intensive on a laptop like this one here to point out. Now it does have a two megapixel front facing webcam of average quality, speakers have also not particularly good. There's a sample of that in my unboxing video where I do actually cover the design in a bit more detail. Now the keyboard that is on this one here, it's backlit so you can turn it on. It doesn't come on automatically, two different stages. And this is actually quite a nice keyboard to type on. I do like it like the original model. No issues with this base bar. The touchpad is large and it is nice to use, but I've noticed with finer little fiddly kind of movements, if you're, for example, in Photoshop or you're in Paint and you wanna select something, it can be a little bit irritating with the finer tiny little movements I have noticed there. And the palm rest, well, this is plastic, probably to stop any feedback or earthing issues, getting like little zaps off it when it's plugged in and charging. So the charge time is about three hours on this one. So what else does it have? Well, port-wise, we've got two USB 3 ports, which will power external hard drives, HDMI 1.4 A-spec, and it does have DC charging, of course, but also power delivery charging from the Type-C port, and it does support uh, HDMI, sorry, 4K 60 hertz with this one as well, which is good. At least we can run a 4K TV or monitor at the full 60 hertz that most of them are supporting. There's also a micro SD card slot, but it's only wired up via a USB 2 hub. So speeds are limited, reads and writes to around 2324 there. So let's have a look now at the performance. I'll run some benchmarks and just some real world tests as well. And even a little bit of gaming. And then my thoughts on the end about the AeroBook Pro 13.3 inch model from Chewy. So when I take a look at the performance, like sometimes with this lower end tech that I review, we do get a bit of stutter with our start menu. So I've got all my files installed and all sorts of bits and pieces. And I've just noticed that now and then Windows can feel a little slow and, and laggy just when you bring things up. It just won't deliver that kind of performance that you would expect. And this is reflected in our benchmarks here as well. So this is Geekbench 5, uh, very low score really. Single core score for just a dual core chip, okay, with the default five watts, it's the power limit level one, it's five watts only, severely restricts its performance and you do feel it in Windows. And I'll show you a little trick too, how to get around this and boost the performance for nothing. And it's quite a good thing to do. And here is Geekbench 4 as well. So it's nothing impressive. It's only a four cores as well with this one. Sorry, threads, four threads, two cores, four threads. But look at the score, how have I done this? How have I managed to boost that performance? So it's a little trick that most people would know with Intel chips that you can, there are still ways, there's a workaround, you have to look on the internet now, I won't go into this in this video, but there's a workaround to actually be able to get Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility to install, which I have. And I do recommend doing this, okay? Because it's very easy to do, just try a undervolt on the CPU here. So all I've done is the core voltage offset just lower this down, okay, to 0 0.075 volts. That's it. And I recommend then using a power boost max of say 10 watts. This is basically doubling it from the default five that it has. That is how I got uh, that score there. So a big improvement. And it just feels a lot better Windows running that because out of the box, 
with that five watts severely restricting its performance. It feels quite sluggy and not particularly good. Now again, I wanted to show you these values here with our screen. So it has basically the same panel that we had with the AeroBook, the first model. And I'm just getting so much pulse width modulation on camera. I don't see it in person here. So Adobe RGB 74% is very good. That's actually a really nice screen. It is fully laminated uh, with glass over the front of it. It's not Gorilla Glass. I believe it's only soda lime glass, so be very careful not to scratch it. It does have a lot of problems with the reflections too as well. NTSC is 71%, sRGB 96 So it's actually quite a good panel. Now the calibration out of the box uh, with the screen was super bad really, okay? It was quite a greenish tint to it and not particularly good. So if you can somehow calibrate the screen, if you know someone who does have a tool to calibrate, then I do recommend that. Now I did run my typical other little tests and things I like to, to run here, but I wanted to point out just a few things that HDMI, the mini HDMI port on this one is only HDMI 1.4 spec. So of course that's all I could get. You can only get 30 hertz and connecting it out up to a 4K TV. It was just a laggy mess at 30 hertz. I don't like it. It'll give me a headache actually. But the Type-C port does save us here. So we can run 4K 60. Now it took a few adapters for me to actually get the 60p. I've got one cable that is straight HDMI to, uh, to type C and that's the one that worked for me which is good okay that's it's nice having this option and you can use of course power delivery to charge the laptop which is going to take about two to well, two and a half to three hours the same with normal charging so it's not particularly quick at charging uh, Geekbench sorry Cinebench R15 here very low end okay 144 CB so this is not a powerhouse this kind of laptop is just recommended for your low-end computing. So documents and things that I'll be showing you later on, all I recommend, do not really try to edit videos. It's painfully slow. It's just going to really frustrate you. So battery life. Now, this is a best-case scenario. I did run it with the screen brightness right in the lowest setting, okay? And I didn't use the backlight keyboard often. So I managed to get 6,026 minutes, which is, I think, is a record for a Core M3 laptop. But if you set the brightness to about 40%, you're going to get about five hours, four and a half hours. So the battery life is disappointing. It is bad. And I'm just showing you the absolute best that you can get out of it. And I was streaming with YouTube here as well. And I was also using Amazon Prime Video. So that's probably why I managed to get such a good battery life runtime here. Uh, and that's why I say that it's really only about five hours that your kind of normal use would be out of this particular machine here. And what about our thermal? So with the restrictive... 5 watt power limit level 1 that it ships with, uh, this is what you're going to have. Okay, thermals are actually pretty good. Now, the underside of it, if you intend to use this laptop on your lap, it does get quite warm, but only when you're really pushing it hard. I've noticed that it will get up to temperatures of about 40, 41, 42, 3 degrees, and that means it's getting a little uncomfortable on the underside to have it resting on your lap that is right there. So I'm running everything in the stock now, no more undervolts, and I wanted to demonstrate the performance that you can expect out of this, just with general kind of tasks. So first up, I'm just in Chrome here, of course, and I'm going to search uh, dogs that I haven't searched before here, and just see how this performs opening up different tabs. And you'll notice it doesn't take too long for this particular chipset at that rather limiting uh, power limit that it has set, that it will start to bog down. And the performances, it really is quite... And lackluster at times you can see that okay it's still loading in that's that's kind of normal all right and anything more than about what i've opened up now so if i start pushing it with more tabs then it's going to get a little bit slower because it's only a a dual core with those four threads so there we go you can see slowing down a little now and not really super quick and that's about it. I wouldn't be pushing, if you want to run like 20 tabs, we've got the RAM for it probably with the 8 gigabytes. Now you can stream 4K video. This is YouTube and it's a little bit stuttery. You can see when you take a look at our stats right here that it's dropping a few frames. So it's dropped 26. It's not entirely perfect. So it's only being shown here at, well, I've got it set to actually to 4K as you can see. Now it's a bit smoother. It's just initially at the beginning it was dropping those frames and now it's running into problems because actually my ISP limits YouTube streaming to like 5 megabits per second. Uh, so that's not helpful at all to show that. 
So I'll get out of this and I just wanted to show you too what it's like at playback of various uh, different video files here. So one of the demanding ones that I like to test out is the Swordsmith demo. This is 60 frames per second 4K. And you see it's not running at 60 frames per second entirely. It's a little bit stuttery at times, although it's not looking too bad here. But it's just not quite perfect. Now if we go over to another demanding file, this is that Jellyfish test one, 140 megabits per second, 10-bit ATVC. It's a little slow at the beginning, see how it does all this kind of stuttering, but it should eventually smooth out. There we go. And okay, the occasional little stutter, so it's still not quite perfect either here with these demanding video files. So anything that's not so demanding, so you're looking at say a 4K clip that you recorded from your mobile phone, which is this one right here, 48 megabits per second, this will be smooth. This is fine, you can see, not a problem, and when I skip ahead with that one. So video playback, it really just depends on the file. I wouldn't push huge demanding files to this particular one for playback, because it's gonna be choppy. So gaming performance with Counter-Strike here, 720p on the lower setting is terrible. You can see, very stuttery. Uh, this is a full server, so it is struggling, this dual core. Of course, the restriction from power limiting all the time that it can't really go over, much over 5 watts here, means that we've got a frame rate that is about 22 frames per second or so average. And it makes it very difficult to play, of course, with that kind of frame rate. Uh, lighter titles should be a little bit more playable, just got to lower the settings, I completely lagged out then. So I am dead, so what I will do now is I'll increase that power limit and I'll undervolt a little bit to see if it's going to make a big difference or not. So now with that power limit increased and an undervolt, we see we're getting a much better frame rate here, 40 frames per second, this is now it's getting a bit better. I mean ideally I want to have 60 the whole time. So if I knock the resolution down to even lower, like 800 times 600, then I think it's getting more towards what you could call playable. So there's probably someone right here who's going to kill me. No, not yet. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's just to show you, though, the undervolting and that power limit can definitely boost our performance a little bit here. But this is not really a system at all for gaming. Okay, guys, so this is really quite an average laptop here that's kind of a bit hard for me to recommend because it is going to be selling for 449 US dollars, the early bird price for the 8 gigabytes, 256 gigabytes of storage. Look at your local market out there. Just have a look around because you can probably get some brand stuff that's got, say, a 10th or 8th generation Intel chip in there so much faster, like a Core i3 or Core i5 that will perform a lot better. It won't be passively cooled, give you much better performance. Okay, you might not actually have a screen as good as this one, that's the thing. Some of those other models will be a much better spec in terms of power, but you could have a very poor screen in them. Some of them are still shipping, I think, with like um, TN panels, yeah, with poor viewing angles, which is not good. So the eyepiece panel on this one is one of the positives. It has a very good keyboard. The trackpad is, touchpad is okay. Um, and then the webcam, the loudspeaker, the weaknesses here. It does have the power delivery, the Type-C port with the 4K 60 hertz. That is all good, okay? But I have seen, and thank you so much guys for everyone that's posted their comments, their feedback on their first unboxing video of this one. By the way, do check it out. Uh, that they're having issues with the original model. So people have uh, bad batteries. So after say 50 or 100 cycles, that's recharge, discharge, and recharge, they're noticing they're getting terrible battery life. Okay, so it looks like Chewy are not using quality battery cells in the long run in the units. Now me as a reviewer, I'm using these models for maybe a month. I had the previous model for about six months or so, and I didn't have any real issues with it. I noticed that maybe I did actually lose a little bit of battery life. Core M3s don't have wonderful battery life anyway. And then hinge issues. I didn't really have any problems, but I did comment uh, that it did loosen up a little bit. Now some people said that after using one of these laptops and traveling around with it, and a normal kind of laptop use, maybe daily use, putting it in your bag, after six months, they had problems with the hinge becoming a little bit loose. Uh, they noticed some people had cracks or just cracked too easy. It's very easy to damage. It's quite a soft alloy that they have on this as well. So these are all things to factor in. Bear in mind, with that price, it's a little hard to recommend then, knowing that if the track record on the previous model wasn't that great, what are we gonna have for build quality in this one? Now I expressed this with Chewy, my contact who mailed me this 
loan unit here to review. Uh, they did say that, oh, no, they've improved the quality, but have they really? I mean, they're aware of the problems, and then some people said they had problems with Chewy support as well. So these are things to all factor in. So I hope you did enjoy this review. At least it was informative. If you're thinking about getting one of these, just consider all of that, please, before you pull the trigger. And I do hope to catch you back in the next video. Bye for now.